Pastor Mark Biltz here from El Shaddai Ministries. Thank you again so much for watching and make sure to subscribe and share. Also, please like this video and we would love to hear your comments. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, I came back from Alabama. As you know, what I've been speaking over the last six months, I kind of consolidated a lot of things of different sermons, and I put it into one. I presented it to Alabama when I was there, John Kilpatrick's Church of His Presence. And it went very well, but what was amazing is as we're coming back on the plane uh, and uh, Sherry and Tina and I were talking and things, more stuff gets downloaded. And it's like, you are not going to believe this. <clears throat> I really think in one way, this is going to be the most significant talk that I've given in 20 years, what you're about to hear. I'm serious. So double buckle up. <laughs> Fasten your shoulder strap too. I mean, it's like... Uh, you know, on the airplane, they give you the routine before the plane takes off, you know, about the oxygen mass dropping. I wish I had some under your chairs because you're going to need them. <laughs> okay, here we go. <clears throat> We're going to start with a, I'm going to try to go slow. I know I talk fast. I was the second youngest of nine kids. And if I wanted anything, I'd be jump in there. You all know I talk fast, so I'm going to try to slow down because I really want you to get this. I say there's two kinds of teachers, one that just wants to get something out and one that wants to get something in. I want this to get in, so I'm going to try as hard as it is to go slower, but that might mean we go a little bit longer. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says to Everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. To everything and a time to every purpose. Do you know what that means? You were created on purpose. I mean, a lot of people, let's say they're adopted or something happened, they wonder I tell you what, you were created on purpose at this time. And like, they, like I like to say, you know, uh, you go to sports and they have track meets and you have a, a relay race where there's like four people on a team. They always save the last person is the one who's the fastest. That's the way it is. They get the baton to pick up any lost thing. We are living at the end of the age, and God chose you to live at this time on purpose because he has great respect for how fast you can run. Okay, so we have to realize you were created on purpose. You could have lived any time in history, a thousand years ago, but no, God wanted you here now. And he says, <clears throat> to how many things? Everything. To every purpose. So how many of you know God has a purpose? And how many know he's going to accomplish his purpose? Look at the next verse, Isaiah 46.10. Some translation says he declared the end from the beginning, but I'm going to use this translation. Making clear from the first what is to come and from past times the things which have not so far come about, saying, God says, my purpose is fixed and I will do all my pleasure. How many of you know God will do what he wants to do, whether we oppose it or like it or not? But that also tells you, if you want to understand the end, Revelation, you've got to go to Genesis. He declared the end from the beginning. And many of you know where the very first word in Hebrew declares everything. And the first verse declares everything. I've gone through it. But I don't have time to do that. Now, look at what Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 8 says, Do not overlook this one fact, beloved. With the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Isn't that amazing? Well, this comes from Psalms 90, verse 4, where it says, A thousand years... In your sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Okay, now here's what's amazing about that verse. 
The word for a thousand is the word aleph. Now, aleph is a letter of the Hebrew alphabet as well. That is the letter aleph, aleph, and that's how you spell aleph. In Hebrew, every letter is a word. So if you have a three-letter word, you got three words within the one word. Well, aleph is the, just like we say alpha and omega in Greek, it's really the aleph and the tab. The aleph is the first letter of Hebrew. The tab is the last letter. But I want you to notice that the word for thousand is aleph, that letter. Well, when we look at this, here is Genesis 1 1. Brashit, bara, Elohim, et, hashemayim, bet, ha'aretz. And we know it's been, we're in 2022 now. So we know it's been about 2,000 years since Messiah. Well, from Messiah to Adam was 4,000 years, which means a day with the Lord is 1,000 years. We've gone 6,000 years. We're about to enter the third day from Messiah's death, or we really have entered it, where he's about to raise us up and we'll live in his sight. What's amazing, look at this. There are one, two, three, four, five. Six alephs in that first phrase referring to we've been given 6,000 years. Right there. Now, if you notice, there are seven Hebrew words in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. In Hebrew, though, there are seven words. And I believe that refers to the 7,000-year reign where the last reign is the Sabbath year. But Bereshit is, in the beginning, created Elohim, Hashemayim, the heavens, and the earth. If you'll notice, you've been robbed in English of that middle word. You've been robbed. Aleph Tav appears about 7,000 times, I believe, uh, and you never get it in English. Okay? But who is the Aleph and the Tav? Yeshua is the Aleph and the Tav. And I want you to notice... The Aleph Tav is the Messiah. And he came, his first appearance was the fourth day or 4,000 years from Adam. Then we see him coming back at the end of the sixth day. And this time the Vav refers to a nail. We will see him whom has been pierced. This is referring to both his comings in the fourth day and the sixth day. In the sixth day he returns and he's the pierced Aleph Tav. Again, this is showing you we have 6,000 years. Now, what's amazing to me is in John, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. Well, when you say in the beginning was the word, Aleph Tav is like our A to Z, everything in the dictionary. So here, in the beginning was the Aleph Tav, the word. And then in Revelation, what do we find He looks and he sees a menorah, and notice there are seven branches in a menorah. Each branch is for one of these words, and in the middle is a flame of fire, and it says, I turned to see the voice that spoke with me being turned. I saw seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, because Yeshua is the middle branch of the menorah, the olive top that he saw. And this is referring in Revelation back to Genesis 1.1. He declared the end from the beginning. Now, when it comes to the calendar, people are always talking about the end of the world. Oh, my gosh, remember Y2K. History, God does not use our pagan Gregorian calendar. How about the Mayan calendar is going to end? Woo! Guess what? God does not use the Mayan calendar. He doesn't use the Muslim calendar. He doesn't even use the Chinese calendar. Okay, God is going to use his calendar. Now, in Genesis 12, Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. How many of you know What year Abraham was born? From Adam. If you go from Adam all the way to Abraham's birth, when you add up all the begets, Abraham was born in 1948. 
Isn't that interesting? The very year Israel becomes a nation from Messiah is 1948, and Abraham was born in 1948. It's all about the patterns. Remember, Moses' tabernacle was based on the pattern, what's in the heavens. How old was Abraham when he entered the promised land? Does anyone remember how old he was? He was 75. Well, 1948 plus 75 means we might enter the promised land in 2023. I'm just using patterns from history. Okay. Look at Revelation 10, 1 through 4. John saw a strong angel coming out of heaven. Now, you have to remember, angel is not a correct translation. Messenger. This is a messenger. I saw another strong messenger coming out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and an arch of colored light was around his head. His face was like the sun, his feet like pillars of fire. This sounds like Yeshua to me. He had in his hand a little open book, and he put his right foot on the sea, his left on the earth, and he gave a loud cry like the angry voice of a lion. Yep, that sounds like Yeshua, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And at his cry, the voices of the seven thunders were sounding. And when the seven thunders had given out their voices, I was about to put their words down, and a voice from heaven came to my ear saying, keep secret the things which the seven thunders said, and do not put them in writing. John is the only one in human history who heard what the seven thunders uttered. He knows what they said, and he didn't share it with us. Okay? He didn't even put it down in writing. And he said, keep this secret. Well, let's go to Revelation 10, 7. We see, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when the sound of his horn is about to come, then will the secret of God be complete, of which he gave the good news to his servants, the prophets. So we see John heard what the seventh thunders uttered. He couldn't write it down. He put it in a book, and then he was told to eat the book. Right? Right? Okay, so he he doesn't write it down, but he eats the book, but he heard what was said. This verse is missed by everybody. I don't think anybody sees this or has commented on it. Look at then what it says, Revelation 10.10. John says, I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. It was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, in my belly it was bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, when it comes to the two witnesses, I believe the two witnesses will be Moses and Elijah. But if you remember, they're confined to Jerusalem. They are in Jerusalem for three and a half years, and I believe they are the two witnesses to the Jewish people. But I believe in the mouth of two or three witnesses, John will come back, and he also will be a witness to the church, to the Gentiles. He's the only one who heard. And he says, you're going to prophesy again. He couldn't put it in writing. Therefore, what he heard was not put in the book of Revelation. Okay. This is something that only he's heard that will be revealed. And so I believe John also is coming back because it explicitly said, you will prophesy again. That is verbally. He's going to be speaking. That's a life voice, not a written because he couldn't write it down. Now, get a load of this. Okay, in Revelation 11.3, I'll give power to my two witnesses, and they're going to prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, that's three and a half years. Everyone agree that's three and a half years? Everyone knows two witnesses? Now, they're going to come first because then the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit, he ends up killing them. And it says here, Revelation, 1, 11, Revelation 11, 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And then in verse 9, 
Those of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Okay, now this also tells you the Jews do not have control of Jerusalem. The Jews bury the very same day. The very fact that you had them laying outside for three and a half days tells you the Gentiles have control of Jerusalem at this point completely. Okay, now get a load of this. <clears throat> Revelation 11, 11, and 12, after the three and a half days, the spirit of life from God enters into them. They stand on their feet, and great fear falls on everybody who saw them, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come on up here, y'all. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You know what's amazing? A lot of people thinking the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to come first, but here you're going to have Moses and Elijah come first, and they're going to have it stop raining. They're going to call, cause water to turn to blood. They're going to cause all these plagues, and everyone's going to rejoice that they're dead. I believe when Moses and Elijah come, everyone's going to think they're the false prophet and the Antichrist. And then when the Antichrist kills them, okay, everyone's going to think that must be Moses and Elijah here now because they killed these bad guys. So it's going to be very deceptive. We know it's going to be very deceptive. There's something else about this I'm going to share in just a minute, but I've got to set the plate here. Daniel, let's jump over to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 26. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city. This is the angel talking to Daniel. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, and so we see not all of it has been fulfilled yet. And it says, and to seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street will be built again, the wall, even in troublous times. After the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's Rome in 70 AD. And the end will be with the flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Okay, let me ask you something. You know, we have the Shemitah cycle. Now, the 70 weeks refer to 490 years, 70 times 7. Everyone understands he's talking about a Shemitah week. If you believe the Lord's ministry lasted three and a half years, where was it in terms of a Shemitah week? Did he begin it at the end of a Shemitah week and it goes to the beginning of the next? Was the three and a half years cut out of the middle? Was his three and a half years at the end of a Shemitah week cycle going into the first? Anybody know? You just read it. At the end of 62 weeks, he'll be cut off, which means he died at the end of a Shemitah cycle, which is why there's only one week left of seven years, and the seven-year tribulation has to begin the first year of a Shemitah cycle. How many of you know Daniel was Jewish? They were punished because they didn't keep the, 70, uh, the cycle, the Shemitah cycle, so that's why the tribulation has to pick up where off where it ended. He died at the end. The seven weeks have gone by. 62 weeks have gone by. That's 69 weeks, which means the 70th week or Daniel's 70th week has to pick up again the first year of a Shemitah cycle. So now we have to know the calendar. Okay, well, when does the next first year of a Shemitah cycle begin? Does that make sense? All right. Now, so here we see. Daniel was Jewish. He was following the Shemitah cycle. Okay, let's go to Daniel 9, 27. Okay, here I show you uh, in the PowerPoint, after 62 weeks, Messiah is going to be cut off. But here's the thing. We just got done talking about the tribulation has to begin on Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of a Shemitah cycle, right? Guess what? When you do that and you see the pattern, if the two witnesses witness for three and a half years, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah, Passover, they die at Passover. And three days later, they rise from the dead, just like Messiah rose three days later from the dead. 
when you get it on the right cycle, everything starts falling into place. This is, it's, it's all math and it's all the cycles. In Daniel 9.27, he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. The big theological debate throughout history is who is the he? Is the he the antichrist that confirms the covenant? Or is the he God who confirms the covenant? All right? Well, guess what? The devil doesn't make any covenant. And he sure doesn't keep it. This is God confirming his covenant. And in the midst of that last week, he says he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease because of the overspreading of abominations. He'll make it desolate even to the consummation that are determined to be poured out upon the desolate. Well, what I think is uh, interesting here in the middle of the week, I, a lot of people say, well, there's going to be a temple because they're going to be doing sacrifices. We don't necessarily need a tent- temple, but you do need at least an altar. Well, They will be doing Passover sacrifices in the millennial reign because Yeshua himself is going to be there and it says so in Ezekiel. But I believe during this last week before Messiah comes to do any Passover sacrifice would be an abomination to God. You following me? Now, the Antichrist wants to do abominations. This is speaking of someone because of the abominations is stopping it. Does that make sense? This is God who has made the covenant one week left, but in the middle, he's going to stop the sacrifices that are going on in the temple because they're not being made to him necessarily. Now, get a load of this. Let's talk for a minute about the Shemitah cycle. Daniel being Jewish, the whole reason they went into captivity was because they hadn't been keeping the Shemitah cycle. And listen to what God says in Leviticus 26, verse 18. God is talking about the Shemitah cycle. And then he says, if you will not yet for all this hearken to me, I will punish you seven times. You see how important the number seven is? The seven-year Shemitah cycle, you don't keep it, I'll punish you seven times more. And then in verse 21, if you still walk contrary to me and don't hearken to me, I'm going to bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. And then in verse 24, Then I will also walk contrary to you and punish you yet seven times more for your sins. Verse 33 through 35, God says, I'm going to scatter you among the heathen. This is what's fulfilled in uh, Daniel's time. I will draw out a sword after you. Your land will be desolate, your cities waste. Then the land will enjoy her Sabbath. See, this is a prophecy of the 70 years that they were in Babylon that the land got a rest. And this was written a thousand years before this happened. And you're going to be in your enemy's land. Even then shall the land rest and enjoy your Sabbath. As long as it lies desolate, it'll rest because it did not rest in your Sabbath when you dwelt on it. Now, Zechariah 14, verse 4a. It talks about his feet landing in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives will cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. How many of you know that has not happened yet? I've been to Israel <laughs> many times, many times. It is still there. There's all millennials who believe everything has happened. They're living in a dream world. That has not happened yet. Okay, now look at this. Zechariah 14, 16. It'll come to pass. Everyone that is left of all the nations that come against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We know the Feast of Tabernacles is in the fall. We know it's Tishri 15, which also means it's a full moon. So we see here, worshiping the king on his throne happens at a full moon. The full moon is the light in the darkness. Messiah is the big light in the darkness. The moon represents the Messiah too, okay? And it says all the people that are left of the nations, every nation has to have representatives coming to Jerusalem to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't, they get no rain and the plague. And in Matthew 25, verse 30 through 32, cast out the unprofitable servant to outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, that refers to being, having to go through the tribulation. 
And then it says, when the Son of Man will come in his glory, and all the angels are coming with him, then shall he sit on the throne of his glory, and before him will be gathered all nations, and will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So again, we see on the Feast of Tabernacles, he's going to sit on his throne. All the nations are going to come, and he's going to do some separating. Let's see. Okay, let's look at Matthew 24, 31. Then he's going to send his angels. It says, with the great sound of a trumpet, they're going to gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Well, here's the thing is, as you most of you may know, Israel has not been able to keep the year of Jubilee for 2,700 years because of the Assyrian captivity around 700 B.C., all the Jews in the northern were taken over to Assyria. And so the Jubilee hasn't been kept for about 2,700 years. We still know when the Jubilee year is. And I will tell you a little bit later. But at the year of Jubilee is when everyone returns back to the land. That is why when it talks about he's going to gather the elect from the four winds, it's because the only way, how many heard that the Lord comes in a year of Jubilee? Okay. And in the year of Jubilee, this is why he gathers the elect from the four winds, because they all have to be there to keep the year of Jubilee. And they're given their land. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me see where I'm going here. All right. Now, uh, let me point out something. Uh, um, a lot of people talk about the Shemitah year, the seventh year. But what's most important really is the first year. Now, uh, I'm pointing, you can see the first year going across to the seventh year. Right now I'm pointing to 1973, 1974. Do you know we got our seven-year bankruptcy laws based on this? This is why the United States, every seven years you claim bankruptcy. It has to do with the seven-year cycle because at the, seventh, at the end of the seventh year, everyone had to be set free financially. Well, I want you to look at what happens. The end of a Shemitah, if you'll notice, 1973 is the end of the seventh, but it's also the beginning of the first because Rosh Hashanah is in October, September, October. Everything is done in patterns, guys. I want you to notice something. 1973, 74, the first year of a Shemitah cycle was a big stock market crash. It was really bad. All, it says it affected all the major stock markets in the world. Okay, 1987 and 2008, stock market crashes of 87 and 2008, what was learned? Everyone knows about 2008, but guess what? There was also one in 87. Not only that, in 2001, the terrorist attack marked a sharp plunge in the stock market with a $1.4 trillion loss. The first week of trading after tax saw the S&P 500 fall more than 14%. So here we see all these stock market crashes are the first year of a Shemitah cycle. But wait, there's more. In 2015, $2 trillion were erased from the stock. Everything happens economically based on the Shemitah cycle. Now, one thing I want to just mention about the Shemitah cycle, which is interesting, we just got done talking about how a day with the Lord uh, as, as a thousand years to us, right? Well, if you take a 24-hour day and you divide it by 24, that means one hour equals about 42 years. If you ever wanted to know what an hour was, it's 42 years. Well, guess what? If you divide both sides by six, you find 10 minutes equals the seven-year Shemitah cycle. And so if you take that times seven, guess what? The Jubilee cycle is 70 minutes. The number seven, the number 70, 70 years captivity. I think it's interesting in God's sight, the 49-year Jubilee cycle is 70 minutes to him. Just an interesting number. Okay. Um, now let me show you some other things. The Jubilee cycle does not go 49 years and then a Jubilee year and then 49 years. That would get everything off hilter skelter like adding an extra day after Sunday between Monday once every 50 years. No, it works like this. 
there's 49 years, and then the first year of the next 49 years is the 50th year. You following me? So think of it this way. Here we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, okay, and seven years going down. Now, on the right side, you can say they're the that's the seventh year, the 14th year, the 21st, 35th, 42nd. Everyone follow me how that works? 49 is the big number you have to realize, not 50, because 50 is always the first year of the next cycle. So what you have to see, the Jubilee year or the first year of every cycle, and 49, 7 times 7 is the big number that you need to think of. Okay. Here we are. We're going to look at Shemitah cycles here. These are correct. And I want you to notice that in 1948, 1949, right in there, there were these four blood moons I talk about in my book that fall on the feast days. This is why they're so important because God said he created the sun and the moon for signs on his feast days. Now, let's look and see how important the first year is in another way. Did you know Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple in 586 B.C. in the first year of a Shemitah cycle? Rome destroyed the temple in 70 A.D., the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Hiroshima, Nagasaki happened the first year of a Shemitah cycle. War is always, a lot of wars are happening the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Okay. Six-day war. Israel recaptured Jerusalem. That was in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Okay, and guess what? Here you've got four blood moons again in the sky. 73, the Yom Kippur War. First year of a cycle. Now, what's fascinating, I was speculating at the time when I first presented this to you, you can only declare a jubilee year on Yom Kippur. And when I saw that, here we have the Yom Kippur War in 73, knowing it was the first year of his Mita cycle, I thought, I'll bet you that was a year of jubilee. Okay? Now, in 8081, the Iraq nuclear war was, uh, uh, the uh, Iraq nuclear power plant was destroyed by Israel. The first intifada took place in 87. Okay, uh, it goes on and on. Here, the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty took place. Uh, here you have the quartet began. That's the four world organizations that want to divide the land of Israel. Uh, you have the Gaza War and the stock market crash. And then you also have this uh, blood moods again. I made that a little bit too big. Okay, here is where we are at right now in 5782. How do we know it's a Shemitah year? Because 5782 is divisible by 7. It's just math. That's how you know where you're at in the Shemitah cycle. You divide it by 7, and you find that's what it is. Now, as I said, the first year of the tribulation has to begin the first year of the Shemitah cycle, which means this coming Rosh Hashanah, the first year of a Shemitah cycle, has a high probability of being the beginning of the tribulation. If the tribulation does not begin this fall, it can't begin for seven more years. Are you understanding the thinking here? Because it has to begin because Daniel was Jewish. Okay. Uh, now, here's the other thing. This is 50 years from the Yom Kippur War. Could this coming fall also be the year of Jubilee? We're going to look at that. And then again, here in the year 2035, 2036 is when the Song of Moses ends, when you go a verse for a year. So here's the thing. This coming Rosh Hashanah, 2022, that is interesting. When it comes to the resurrection of the dead, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, it will happen on Rosh Hashanah. But I don't get into whether it's at the beginning, at the middle, or at the end. What I do know is starting this Rosh Hashanah, every Rosh Hashanah, I would be anticipating the resurrection of the dead and being ready. Wow, 
Now that is, I'll have to explain something to someone later. Okay, here we go. Some people tell me, well, these certain biblical scholars believe that 1989-1990 was a jubilee uh, or was a, a jubilee year. Or they say, no, 1999-2000 was a jubilee year. Well, guess what? Those can't be jubilee years because jubilee years have to be the first year of a Shemitah cycle. Now, if you want to debate with me whether 2001 or 1994 was the year of jubilee, I'm open to debate that. That at least makes sense. But don't tell me some year that is in the middle of a Shemitah cycle is the jubilee year. It doesn't work. Okay? So we know these are Shemitah years. It's the Hebrew year divided by seven. Okay. That was the Yom Kippur War right there in 7374. Well, guess what? 50 years later is 2022-2023. Well, what's happening, I want to show you is this. The way you know if a year is a jubilee year is the math. If it's divisible by 49, you know the following year is a jubilee year. Well, guess what? 5733 is divisible by 49. It's 117. So that was a jubilee year. This September, we are going to begin a jubilee year as well as the first year of a Shemitah cycle, 118. So we know from the math that this fall not only is the first year of a Shemitah cycle, this fall is the year of jubilee it begins. It's the math. You don't, either people see it or they don't. I don't argue with a blind person over a work of art. I don't argue with a deaf person over a piece of music. Okay, this is just math. This is, now, whether the Lord returns, I'm not saying the Lord's going to return. See, this again goes back to what I am saying versus what I'm not saying. But I am saying, just like you have to wait until 2029 for the tribulation, if it doesn't start this fall, you got to wait 50 more years if he doesn't come back in the year of Jubilee. you got to wait 50 more years. If you believe he even comes in the year of Jubilee, some don't. So I'm just kind of laying out the bone structure. You can fill it in however you want. Okay. Um, now, I think I read Matthew 24. I will again just in case. 31, what does God do? He sends his angels with the great sound of a shofar. They gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, we all know about the wheat and the tares. I'm going to talk to you about the grapes and the grapes. I mean, God calls us his wife, his kids. We're his brother. We're his friend. God is always using different relationships. And so you have to look at it in terms of what is going on. Well, I'm going to talk to you about the grapes and the grapes. Deuter first, let's go to Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 12. Moses commanded them at the end of every seven years. Okay, this means you've gone through the whole cycle. You're at the end of the seventh year in the solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles. If the year ends on Rosh Hashanah, Tabernacle's on the 15th, so it's the end of the year, but you're 15 days into the next year, okay? And notice the importance of the Feast of Tabernacles. It says, when all of Israel comes to appear before the Lord, this is why everyone has to be there, why he has to gather everybody, in the place which he chooses, you're to read this law before all of Israel in their hearing, then he says what? So gather everybody together, the men, the women, the children, the stranger that is within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. Not anybody could tell everyone to come to Jerusalem. Well, who the heck are you? You ain't the boss of me. So it's the king of Israel. It was his responsibility to gather, to sound the trumpet and to gather everybody to himself at the end of the Shemitah cycle on the Feast of Tabernacles. Could this coming tabernacle be the day the king of Israel, because it's not only the end of the Shemitah, the year of Jubilee, blow the shofar and gather all the elect to be with him so they can hear the Torah in the heavenly places. Now, get a load of this. 
me see. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto who? The Son of Man, and he's coming on the clouds. His feet are not landing on the Mount of Olives. His feet do not land on the Mount of Olives. He's coming with the clouds of heaven. He comes to the Ancient of Days. They brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom which will not be destroyed. We know this is a Feast of Tabernacles event also. You following me? Okay, because the, you see the throne and the dominion and all nations have to come to him on the Feast of Tabernacles. So they see him coming on the clouds of heaven. What do we see in Revelation 14? I looked and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man. There it is. Having on his head a golden crown. And look at this. This is Yeshua. And in his hand is a sharp sickle. And another angel comes out from the temple crying with a loud voice to him, Yeshua, sitting on the cloud. And he says, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time is come for you to reap. The harvest of the earth is ripe. And he does head on the cloud, thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So here Yeshua comes in. He reaps all the good grapes. And then what do we find? Another angel comes out of the temple, which is in heaven. And he also had a sharp sickle. And another angel comes out from the altar, which had the power of a fire, and Christ him with a loud cry that had the sharp sickle and says, now you thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Those are the bad grapes that it then goes says they'll be trampled and smashed. And so you have some good grapes being reaped first. Then you have the bad grapes being thrown in the grapes of wrath. Now, look at this in uh, Leviticus 25, that's the big chapter, 8 through 13. God says you will number seven Sabbaths. What, seven times seven? There you go, that's the key. Every 49 years, then shall you make a proclamation with a blast of the shofar on when? The 10th day of the seventh month. That's Yom Kippur. So the year of Jubilee is celebrated on Yom Kippur, which is why that was a clue in 73 that that was a Yom Kippur, uh, was a year of Jubilee. In the day of atonement, you to make a proclamation with the horn throughout all your land, you will hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It'll be a Jubilee. And everyone returns to his possession. You'll return every man to his family. A Jubilee shall that 50th year be to you. You're not going to sow or reap or grow anything, nor gather the grapes of it all of the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee, it's holy to you. You will eat the increase out of the field, so you can't eat the fruit. In this year of jubilee, everyone returns to his possession. Well, guess what? Look what Leviticus 25, 23 says. The land will not be sold forever because God says the land is mine. So all the land is going to return back to the Lord. As a matter of fact, look at Psalm 24, 1. The whole earth is the Lord's in the fullness, the world, and everyone who dwells on it. Everything belongs to God. In a year of Jubilee, it's like God has lent this world out to us humans, but in the year of Jubilee, he's coming back and he says, look, nothing more is going to be sold. The land is mine, and now I'm, I'm in charge here. This is like with the Pharaoh and the Exodus. Okay, God says, okay, now I'm going to be involved in human history like never before. Now, get a load of this. If you remember, Passover was the barley harvest. Pentecost is the wheat harvest. And tabernacles is what? The grape harvest. If he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if he filled Passover at Passover in the spring, Shavuot or Pentecost in the summer, he will fulfill the fall feast to the day of his second coming. So the prophetic events will happen on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Kippur, on the Feast of Tabernacles. So we look at the pattern of the grapes because now we're looking at the grape harvest. Well, you're going to find this very fascinating. There's a winemaker in the Judean hills, and he told this website 
We harvest manually at night starting about 10 p.m. and finish about 5 in the morning. The reason we harvest at night is mainly for the temperature. And the Lord is coming at night, okay, to do his harvest as well. He says the grapes get to the sorting table in the winery about 6 a.m. with temperatures of 64 degrees in, you know, September, October. If we, have, if we harvest it during the day, the temperature of the grapes would be 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Who wants to work when it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit manually pulling all your grapes? Harvesting is done at night. And then it says, harvesting at night means better complexity of aromatics, better control for the start of the fermentation, less oxidation of the fruit. So I think it's interesting, the harvest is at night. And it always talks about the thief in the night who comes at night and which, uh, if you're watching or not. So here's a picture of them harvesting at night. Uh, you know, here's another picture, manually cutting the grapes at night. But... You ready for this? There's an order for the grape harvest. I don't know how many of you are wine connoisseurs, but the sparkling wine grapes are always harvested first. The Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, to ensure lower sugar levels. Then most of the white wine grapes make their way to crush. Uh, Viticulturally speaking, which means according to the grape harvesting, the red wine grapes are typically next in the harvest line as they take a bit longer to reach full maturation. And when it talks about the times of the Gentiles as full, it doesn't mean a quantity. It means the Gentiles have finally grown up. They finally matured. You don't harvest something when it's not mature. God doesn't want to marry a child bride. He wants a bride. And he's waiting for the church to grow up. Then... Next in the harvest line, as they take a bit longer to reach full maturation, finally, there's the ice wines make their way to crush after going some serious dehydration on the vine to produce a raisin-like grape with highly concentrated sugars, perfect for the dessert wines. When I see about this serious dehydration, that's the body of Messiah that's going through the tribulation, and at the very end, they're here for the dessert. Messiah then harv There's a lot of people say because of the rapture. It's at the beginning. I have proof it's in the middle. I have proof it's at the end. Well, guess what? They were arguing in Messiah's time. He's supposed to be coming out of Egypt. No, he's born in Bethlehem. No, he's called the Nazarene. They were all right. I would not be surprised if there isn't several harvests during the tribulation. That's the grape harvest. These ice, I mean, you have the sparkling wine, then you have your red wines, then you have your dessert ice wines. Well, guess what? Here's everything you need to know about ice wines and your, its unique facts. If you'll notice, these are amber-colored wine. It was 94 degrees during the day. They even harvest the grapes in Israel in the winter. There are different phases of when the grapes are picked, okay? And they're but here's the thing that's amazing. Ice wine harvesting is done in the chilly midnight or early hours of the morning. Harvesting requires a large workforce, enough to pluck the entire crop in just a matter of a few short hours, which is why in Matthew 13, it says the enemy that sold them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. He needs a lot of angels to reap that last harvest. And it has to be done within a short time frame. <sighs> Okay. Again, Luke 12, 35 to 37. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for the master to come home from the wedding feast. They missed the wedding feast. So that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants when the master finds them finally awake. When he comes, he will dress himself for service. Have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them the ice wine. <laughs> the dessert wine. That's why he says the believers are some that are building with wood, hay, and stubble, some that are building with gold, silver, precious stones. We're all at a different place in our walk with God. The question is not, hey, I, got, I know God. I got Jesus in my pocket. I'll pull him out when I need him. It's all about relationship. How close do we want to be? Okay, so now, yeah, <laughs> this is so crazy. Okay, 
Now, I'm, I'm going to also give you further scriptural proof. I mean, a lot of the preachers today will give you one Bible verse and talk for 45 minutes about who knows what. I just want to give you verse after verse after verse. You can check it out yourself. Listen to Amos chapter 9. This is such an incredible verse, 11 and 12. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of who? Hmm, that tabernacle. What if that's going to happen on the Feast of Tabernacles? It's fallen, and I'm going to close up the breaches. I will raise up his ruins. I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name. These are the Gentiles. It's talking about he's going to raise up the tabernacle of David, which allowed Gentiles to come around the, ta the tabernacle. And here God is going to gather the believers, the heathen, the Gentiles who are called by his name, says the Lord is going to do this. And then look at the next verse, Amos 9.13. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, the plowman will overtake the reaper. And look at this, the treader of grapes, him that sow seed in the mountains will drop with the sweet wine. That's the last wine of the harvest, and the hills will melt. Okay, so now let me show you this. Proverbs 7 is actually a prophecy. Most people don't think of Proverbs as prophetic. But it talks about the harlot of revelation during the tribulation. Proverbs 7, 8 through 10, passing through the street near her corner. What in the world is he even doing down there? He went the way to her house. He in, in when? In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. This is referring to the tribulation. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. Why is he going to the red light district anyway? But now watch what happens. She is a religious harlot. And she says, therefore, I came to meet you diligently to seek your face, and I found you. I've decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Now, before I show you the blockbuster verse that's next, I've got to set it up here. Look at Matthew. Matthew 25, all about end times. Here, or Matthew 24, too. But look at this. Here he's talking about the evil servants. And he says, if that evil servant shall say in his heart, oh, my Lord, Terry, he's not coming back for another thousand years or something. And he begins to beat his fellow servants and will eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of who? That servant will come in a day when he doesn't expect it and an hour when he doesn't know. When he talks about the thief coming in the night, you won't know the day or the hour. He's speaking to the evil servants. He's speaking to the foolish virgins. He's speaking to the sleeping church. Everywhere, go back and look at the context. Matthew 25, the foolish virgins. Oh, that's where the foolish virgins is, but I want to show you this. After the, virgin, the foolish virgin story, he goes in and he talks about the kingdom of God. And he said, it is when a man goes into what? A... Okay, think of earth to heaven, God, Jesus, going far country. He called his own servants, delivered unto them his goods. One he gave five talents, another two, another one to each according to his several ability, and he goes on his journey. So here the master has a bag of money. He gives it to the servants, and he goes on a long journey. Well, the problem is that we just saw in Matthew 24, they thought, well, he's not coming back. Just like uh, when the cat's away, the mice do play at work or wherever we'll get a load of this verse now but when the first came these are the one the the parable of the people who worked 24 hours versus one hour and they got paid the same when the first came they supposed they should have received more and they likewise received every man a penny when they received it they murmured against the good man of the house who is the good man of the house messiah yeshua is the good man of the house he's the one that's gone on a long journey which is why i say again he says then to the foolish virgins, he answered, truly I say to who? To you. I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you don't know the day or the hour. A lot of people take that whole thing out of context saying we're supposed to just be stupid. Now, when it talks about not knowing the day or the hour, there's a lot of prophetic events yet to come. There's many biblical wars that are going to take place. You have the Psalm 83 war, the Isaiah 17 war, the Gog Magog war, the Zechariah 12 war. You have a peace agreement that's supposed to be signed. We have the tribulation to begin. 
We have the two witnesses prophesying for three and a half years. We have the seals and trumpets taking place. The Antichrist is supposed to be revealed. The resurrection of the dead takes place and the believers are transformed. We know the Lord's feet land on the Mount of Olives. The millennial reign begins. So when you say the day of the hour, we're not supposed to know well, which event. We're not supposed to the day of the hour when the peace agreement happens. We're not supposed to know the day of the hour of the tribulation. We're not supposed to know the day of the hour of the Antichrist is revealed. For someone just to say we're supposed to stay stupid, that's not very smart. You know, here, I don't see anything coming. Well, this is much like the people today. I don't see anything coming. Uh, but Luke says when these things begin to come to pass, what are you supposed to do? Not look up. I mean, not look down. You're supposed to look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. Okay, with that said now, going back to Proverbs, look what the harlot then says to this foolish man. The good man is not home. He's gone on a long journey. He's taken a bag of money with him. He'll come home at the day appointed. The devil knows God's calendar, and he knows. When you read the day appointed, we think in our mind, well, that means a specific time. Guess what? That's a wrong translation. It's close. It is close. Here's the Jewish translation. He's taking a bag of money with him. He'll come home at the full moon. That's the Feast of Tabernacles, people. That is an appointed day. And guess what? When it comes to his throne, is that word I told you? That same word is translated as full moon. The word for throne and full moon are simultaneously, which is why all nations, it'll come to pass, everyone that has left the nations will came against Jerusalem, will even go up from year to year to worship the king on the throne, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is at the full moon. Throne and full moon are the same Hebrew word. Okay. Now, as I said, it's at the end of the Shemitah cycle on the Feast of Tabernacles when he reads the law. He's the king. The king is reading the law. It's called the Hakel. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the Hakel. But it talks about that was the origin of public reading of the Torah. Deuteronomy's command to publicly read the Torah on Sukkot every seven years appears in the stories about King Josiah, King Agrippa, Ezra the scribe. The latter's innovative ceremony served as a model of what became the synagogue Torah readings. Here it is in Deuteronomy 31, 10, 11. And Moses commanded them saying, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel comes before the Lord, that's why the elect is going to be drawn together. All Israel comes up here for the Lord your God in the place he chooses. You will read this law before Israel all in their hearing. Yeshua is the king of Israel, and on the Feast of Tabernacles, he will make sure all those that have been resurrected will be gathered together so he can read the Torah. Verse 12, gather the people together, the men, the women, the children, the stranger that is within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. I'm going to close with this. Many of you have heard of Mosai Shabbat. That means at the end of Shabbat, okay, that little right between the first day of the week, the last seventh day of the week, remember Paul went and preached till midnight? That was during Motzei Shabbat, right there from darkness uh, to midnight. There is a song that is sung during Havdalah, Motzei Shabbat, after everything, every single Saturday, many of you know it, Eliyahu ha navi, Eliha Yahu ha tishbi. Okay, what that is saying is Elijah the prophet, Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah the Giladite. May he soon in our days come to us with the Messiah, the son of David. They believe it'll be at the not only the end of a Shabbat, but the end of the Shmat, Shabbat of the seventh year, that that's when he will appear. Okay, it's not just the seventh year, the seventh uh, day Sabbath, or even the seventh year Sabbath, uh, but also in the year of Jubilee. Look at this. This is in the Talmud, Sanhedrin 97a, where it talks about the tablet of, da of David that has fallen. And I want you to notice this Hebrew. I'll read it for you here in just a minute. But basically what this is saying is, the sages taught with regard to the Shemitah cycle during which the Messiah, the son of David, comes. Okay. Well, 
The sages taught right there. Let me have, go to my last page. It's Bamotza'e Shvi'it Ben David Ba, which means during the year after the conclusion of the sabbatical year is when the son of David comes. That means in a year of Jubilee, which starts this fall. And if it doesn't happen this fall, the next year of Jubilee is 50 years from now. So all every one of you put all that in your own pipe and smoke it however you want. All I'm saying is we need to be looking up, especially the next two Shemitah cycles are 14 years. The problem is many of the church is sleeping. They want just a few more minutes, but it's time for the harvest. Let's stand and pray. Sorry, I went a little bit longer. Just wanted to make sure you guys got the importance of this lesson and where we're at on the biblical timetable. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you. I just pray that you would all that you would give all of us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand. You are loudly calling your children to wake up. You want them to go in the first harvest. So, Father, we just thank you for to uh, we thank you for everything you're doing for the nation of Israel. And even as you told Moses to tell Aaron this prayer that not only would you bless your people, you would even write your name on them. Ivarekha Adonai Vaish Mareka Yaer Adonai Panavilecha Vihuneka Yisa Adonai Panavilecha Vesem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. We'll see you next Shabbat. Amen.